ki tēnā hui, ngā kanui to mihi, kanui to mihi, kanui to mihi. It's basically is saying greetings to you all. Good morning. Atamarie. Here I am in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it's a privilege to be on the site. So, um, so I'll talk briefly about my, the poems you're going to hear this morning. I'll just scroll them down in front of me. Um, and um, just tell you, I, I don't like particularly going in, in, in doing a, uh, a preface to each poem, so I'd rather just get it done and over with now than I can get and go, go through the poems. Um, but I think basically one of the things it's quite good to um, know, and you will know that New Zealand is at the other side of the world and it's surrounded by ocean, so the sea is an important element. And in a lot of our, our literature, that's what you're going to you're going to get. The secret is there, um, and the islands themselves, uh, in fact, unlike very much like UK, where you're uh, an island nation too. Except you have the, the beauty of uh, the continent right next to you. Hop and skip too. We don't. We just splash into the water either side, into the, into the Tasman Sea or into the Pacific Ocean. So we're kind of isolated like that, but in this modern day and age, of course, everything is brought to us as well. Uh, so the sea is a powerful force. And the other thing is that New Zealand, of course, was uh, uplifted out of the ocean by earthquakes and volcanic activity. I happen to come from a volcanic area, and so my uh, poems can be uh, imbued with uh, that, that kind of atmosphere as I, as I read through them, especially this, the, these uh, the slot here that I've got in front of me. So I'm going to go, uh, and, and the other thing is, it's a female aspect. And in these poems runs a female aspect. What I mean by that is that, you know, you're going to get a girl, you're going to get a woman, young woman, old woman, you're going to get mythological women. It's all sort of within the, in the text and the formatting of the poems themselves. So with that in mind, I'll start reading these through um, and uh, I'll have a little break further down and then I'll finish them off. First poem that I'm going to read to you is called Blood Types. Oops, getting it right in front of me. Right, Blood Types. He's seen them caught out after dark, crossing to an island's pinnacle, to its sky, to its eye in the sky. He's seen the winged silhouettes high on ridges, colliding with clouds. Clouds retelling nighttime stories of swans and owls, of crystalline waters, the sculptured headlands of an island's inception, of a dog sleeping on a martyr's stone. He's seen this elevated pathway, rough but visible, decaying with nightmares, a pathway leading into hills of fragmented philosophies of religious hunters on the scrounge. He's experienced it all his hunger for a woman, his blood type, her blood type, her laughter, the way she whispers fables of how these green volcanoes undulate to the river, how black bubbles squeeze from old vents. He sees her at the end of the road, conspicuous, cloaked, immured in seclusion. He craves for the need to survive the primal bed of their imaginations. Their nights amongst dreams of long-legged spiders, bats, and albino inhabitants with glowing antennae. He craves for how the woman lives, her eye recognition, her scent rubbed in grass, rubbed on fences, on the walls of houses. Once they were fabulous children, once, mad as it seems, he gave the sun a small girl's crooked smile. Mother figure. Bones shiver in a neon morning light. You dream of a mother figure lying flat on grass. You ask about favors like, who's the mouthpiece of this woman? Do you sit beside her? Speak of her on her behalf. Do people jump to her gestures, her flashing fingernails? Her birthday slips down a calendar of distant slopes. You ask why she lies deep in flowers. Hands smooth, legs smooth. She sizes up mountains and valleys. 
She studies a frog's inflated grin, a cloud gasping for air. She washes her face in the sky's soft foam. Steel pylons get up and wrap themselves in fog. A walled city waits for its turn to play. For her, paradise is best, diving into an ocean's heavy surge. You imagine landfall, islands giving birth, a saint's footsteps locked in stone. You ask, is she anything like your mother? The Age of Discovery. Am I reading these too fast? Yeah. Okay. In the Age of Discovery, is a gull shitting on a stone head? Is mold creeping into its stone cracks? Time to feel the sun on stilts, stepping through rooftops. I stare at this woman, taking in mouthfuls of sky, taking in the river, the rapids, and a man kicking pumice heat. She erases aspects of a dream time. She flicks a smile. She's familiar with the circus of her thinking. We run to the river and plunge into cushions of sunlight. We support episodes of leaping through rhythmic, fiery hoops. Who says I shouldn't try and enter the fern box of this green-lipped woman? Who says I fucking shouldn't? I revisit the age of discovery. She reacts swiftly, snapping shut her thighs, and a child clings to her clothes, clings to the sound of a room breathing. We live in separate houses, no doors open, no doors close. Wildflowers grow in our garden. What shall we do? In this self-made labyrinth, this uterine center, there's this precise angled gyration to every day. And every day it unfolds, the mountains unfold, the sky unfolds and shoots up from its white hole. The sea scars cliffs, slashes at sand, the sea assaults people, climbing over people. So what to do? You prepare a meal, create a world, and a mouth leaps out, snaps open, trying to latch on. Children stand on sun castles. A man lights a newspaper, watches it burn. A woman swallows pills. A nation on fire runs into the sea. So what shall we do? A stuffed bear hops into a boy's bed to listen to his story. Caged boredom. Caged boredom clatters at windows. A cavalcade of stars flies off the roof. I track a girl's dreamy meanderings. I listen to wet chunks of summer. I eat plums, read poetry, have nightly visits from the girl who continually lives with who I am. I think particles, missing persons, gaps in the story. I track her dream egos. The way forward is living through a storm. The chill factor, the barb horned beetles humping through the night. I compete daily for her. I compete for the chemistry, the sound of a singer, the sound of her voice. She follows the sun, the taste of the Pacific, the blue pearl clipped to the tip of her tongue. I lie down in tussock, listening for arteries pulsing in the dirt. She is who she is. She is who she is, wallowing in a warm pool of mud. I blame the weather, the heat, the woman who fits neatly into this picture. She is who she is. She walks beaches, paddocks, the riverbanks. She speaks of silences. I say love initiates, love clots the blood. I imagine taking apricots from trees, grapes from the trellis, the morning's dark treacle from the sun. Today I dig a trench for the moon to sleep in. The woman hunts for goats and rabbits. She comes fierce-eyed, bordering on the mythical. We exchange simplicity. She picks up a handful of childhood skins. She only, she's only who she is a child undoing the stitches of her past. 
made of wood. Celebrated for its steeple, its frescoes, its human haunts, I throw glass stones into the swirling thermals of a toxic throat, into the heat haze of a backstreet opera. Moons split moons. Differences impact on wooden idols illuminated in relief. We live the existence of a passion flower. We squirm at the touch of a fingerprint on pollen. I throw stones and the earth leaps up and swallows them. I risk walking between silica mouths, licking off sulfur crumbs. Visitors dress up for the event. Children dress up. They traffic ideas on heliocentric living. They light up my home, marginalized as where I like to juggle my unpinned imperatives. A girl cycles towards the sun. We live a brief petaled existence. The ground is hot is covered in crushed yellow crystals. One about dolphins. Again, you've been sewing with dolphins. You arrive home, weather creased, disheveled, your voice hot in my head. I see the world bulked up from the glut of summer. I smell its sweat pores, its short, sharp breaths. Each morning, we unpack pieces of ourselves. We create a folklore which tells of beaches, the sea, the percussional nudging of dolphins. We participate in re rever reversing our deficiencies. We call it living off rarefied air. We've lost touch with the South Pole, the Aurora Australis. We've lost the meaning of hands on hands, words feeling for the right veins. The road is divided by ditches, Lampposts bend their ears to windows, listening to stories of sleepers, call it ghosting close to the sonic softness of a moon's reflection. Silence of the sea. Nothing satisfactorily explains why we've come to view this last transference of evening light on clouds on this silhouetted couple. We carry with us stories and chants of forests and deserts, of sod villages, people who like, who live by peat and stone. We are killers and lovers, druids and cult figures surrounded by winter fires. How far the morning seems, how far the city which pulses with the buoyancy of children. Trees rustle small conversations. I grapple to understand the purpose of your body close to mine. I want to suffocate the spaces between us, squeeze out the folds of wildness. Despite difficult intentions, we need to walk these gardens, these parklands. We need to pause for a time to feel the silence of the sea. I don't know, I don't know how long I've been reading, but uh, I've got about four short, four or five short poems, if you want me to read them, or I don't want to take out other people's time, that's all. No, please read them, please read Happy with that? Okay. These are what I call 14-liners, not really sonnets, they're just 14-liners. I've been working on a, some poems for a lot, for many years now, called the haptic poems. Uh, and basically, the, the word haptic means to touch something, um, and feel it and get some uh, response from the feeling of some object. So I can look at these 40 liners and I think, well, it'd be great to be able to get the people listening to them to grab the images and feel the images. That's why I call them the haptic poems. So this one's called Childhood. Why this crumpled overcoat in summer, this podium reserved for talking? I listen to the river, to seagulls, to the disheveled person with monuments for bones, who gambles away the hills and lakes, risks losing what he breathes. He rolls in his own contours, plays his hand, hopes it will define the person he really is. His childhood slides through a clarinet's thirst for hitting high notes. I listen to the river and watch for rain. A commuter train scorches past on the platform. A small boy 
bites into his granny's apple. The showman. Strapped to a star wheel, the showman spins to the conditions. He views earth and sky from many angles, rising or falling. He gestures with outstretched arms, hurtles through a molecular chaos of blood vessels and into the mass of a dark red hole. He plunges into Orpheus's vent, swims the underground pools of for thermal lovers. The showman unfolds hy hydraulically and hangs like a colossal puzzle, preparing for the next southerly blast, the next god breath to stand him on his head. His astral pendulum seldom stops. The weather shapes the size of his heart. Night shift. Surveying chunks of scientific sparkle, we ask too much of ourselves, too much of the night sky. I distort an in intimacy of body shapes, a fingering of soft shadows. I'm fascinated by this grope dead piece together in perfection. I feel a city's night shift. I move nearer, not worrying too much what I should do or if she's interested, for she's alive in my head, alive to the flickering of a late night movie. She features on the ceiling above our bed, mesmerized. She half submerges into the miasmic camouflage of a forest. I like standing. I like standing, feeling through gaps, knowing I'm not the only one inhabiting this hollow shaft, this glazed eye of silent motion. I like gaps, the sense of being aware of a stark transparency, the tingles of sky fade, earth fade, I listen to more than I should. Time enough spent window wiping the winter mists from which obscure the lagoon. Enough for sires to resurrect a phantom groping after one morning, one more morning, coloring in the skinned remains of a rainbow. Uh, two more. So yesterday's astral cons consumption. Yesterday's astral consumption isn't lost. The mountains will cough it all up, as regular as sun up, as fish leaping. The sea rubs against my skin, against the bodies of maimed fantasies. It uses me as a thoroughfare. I feel intimacy, a topsy-turvy of grief and ecstasy. The sea is close, it's closer. The sea pounds its shells, it guts itself on jagged rocks on an island sinking in mud. The sea is a carnival. Last one, I think, yes it is. Uh, you don't appear to notice. You don't appear to notice the river twisting, bucking in a blue flabby disguise, churning through rapids, through the stilts of trees, you ignore the smell of a metaphor. You color in your psychology to make things more complex. For instance, I caught you once asleep with your childhood ecstasies, undressing images shrinking into the eyeball of a dream. Kia ora koutou. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. That was some. Um... I like that last point particularly, I think. But I'd lovely to hear your work in your own voice rather than my own voice in my head. Um, I should also add in the presence of, uh, I think, both the editor and the deputy editor that Ian also has work in the new issue of the Splendid Long Poem magazine. Um, so moving a little closer to home for me and much further away from, from Ian in New Zealand, uh, tonight's second reader, uh, Kate Ashton, joined us from Nairn on the Murray Firth near Inverness. Kate was born in Scotland and returned there in 2003 after nearly 25 years in the Netherlands. She writes narrative fiction and non-fiction as well as working as a translator and her poems have appeared in UK magazines including Causeway, The Shop, Agenda, Shadow Train, Shearsman and Long Poem magazine as well as now three times in Molly Bloom. Her first full collection, Who by Water, was published by Shearsman Books in 2016. Her work, though very varied, always comes the sense of impassioned commitment, uh, none more so than her powerful piece, Chernobyl, 
which appears in the current issue of Molly Bloom just after the 35th anniversary of that nuclear disaster. Um, I'll hand you over now to Kate. Thank you, Aidan, very much for that introduction. And also for the honour of reading um, at the last issue of Molly Bloom before your coming sabbatical. Um, I'm going to read from my, a couple of poems from my 2016 collection, Who by Water, and start with the closing section of the eponymous sequence. Sophia, this was how you came before, rough-tongued tale-teller, wild as rain, shy prodigal of no abode or name, vagrant voyager, woe-desailed son of she who brought obedience to birth, where day by day we test oblivion, wandering barefoot where the world ends, writing our name in last light, gazing out to where the shard-dashed alabaster heart husk rides of every creature lost from flight, ought in night set, <clears throat> downed by brine, clustered in the quill, where only gimlet sky should be. I have come to the very edge, where words are washed away, and I'm afraid for that sweet breath. Salt milk suckled speak of death by sea, but not by drowning. Cold soliloquy of broken jade, rinsed of old servitudes, and quietly dressed, devoid of histories, unfinished, proud. Um, the next poem is a tribute to the radical white South African anti-apartheid poet, Ingrid Jonker, not much known here, I think, in, um, in Britain. She was a daughter of a fascist father who walked, and she walked into the sea in 1965 when she was 32, leaving an eight-year-old daughter, Simone. 30 years later, Nelson Mandela read her poem, The Child, at the inauguration of a free South Africa, a tribute which went, which went some way to annulling the critical annihilation she had suffered from the literati of her day, among them her lover, the eminent Dutch poet André Brink. Ingrid um, had been living as a small child with her mother and sisters at her grandmother's on the coast near Cape Town, at a place she called Milk Bay, when the mother was suddenly committed to a mental asylum. The epigram is from a Yonka poem in Afrikaans and means mummy isn't a person anymore. Milk Bay. Mama is ni mi romance Watch, my daughter, how the tide hides its mutability, glides hushed in lover's arms from ebb to flow. The night I felt you breast womb water, tip slow somersault, an enemy brush my floating rib, I knew to call you Simone, seashore, something not like me. Take care, my sweetling, my heart, and don't go in too far, never above your middle, Mama used to say, before her words turned whiter than wing lightning, ma chérie, bright flickering above Milk Bay. I was a starfish, cast from salmon-bellied cloud clasp down between dune grass and rack, and in the shark fin shadow of the rocks, made a sand hole for my precious things, quartz and conch and green sea glass, but my friend would not come and see. Later, he said, later, and over and again, the tumbled tide dismissed us with its promises, through us it's perhaps and when, until the river mouthed him free, wrapping his tulip hips with weed, his face a sip of sea mare milk and salt speak on his lips. Listen, my crimson-hearted one, my lamb, take care, the men are monsters here. Beware cheap secrets breathed into your hair, kisses that dumbfound your mouth, as silver clappered as a bell. Fetch your bucket and spade. Look, a yellow moon lies on its back between a shell-strewn heaven and the galaxy-skimmed wave. All day we've played, 
but mummy madness is a game I cannot win. Wanting too rife, too near a daughter and too far a wife. See how the shore wears water's frown? It's not the dark man, darling, you must fear, but he whose pallor weighs upon him like a crown. I lay between black promises and the whiteness of their lies. It was baptism by desire I would not learn. They could not love my wildness or my rhymes. Stay safe, daughter, above the brim. Frilled penance lift, silk streamers fill milk bay. I dream salt sequined Spartacus, unbound and gentle as the dawn. And yes, and yes, he says, and draws me roaring down. Here's my sequence um, marking the anniversary of the disaster at Chernobyl. Um, I think everyone will know about it. Um, the catastrophic meltdown of reactor number four in the Ukraine, um, contaminating a vast area, which is still an exclusion zone today. And thousands of people e e um, evacuated from their homes and villages and the mortality and morbidity figures still rising. The epigram to this poem is from a book of, uh, based on witness citations. It's a wonderful book um, called Chernobyl Prayer by Svetlana Alexievich. Chernobyl, 26th of April, 1986. He was choking on his own innards. I'd put a bandage on my hand and slip it into his mouth, scoop it all out. This was my sweetheart, my lover. Kill to the poor befuddled prince, whose only skill was blunder, who glanced above only to count the banners of his armor, army against clouds lit by labeled suns, to estimate the drama in which he pranced untiringly, discern some foreign threat which might require unmasking and reinforcement of the dike, while Nemesis crept up on him from behind and threw aside the bunker, raised ram-rigid silo, sank as if a missile sullenly declined, stayed repressed, enraged upon the pad, rehearsing inferno, choked outgrowth of concrete catafalque, fallen too low in soothing bathe, cracked jacket closely made, knit, pearl, core bright as magma, bright enough to blind to plumes of transparent slaughter, that decked the hooded firefighter, rising, rising beyond his kamikaze strike, untouchable, white, scorching, skin on skin, homecoming, postponed, backdated, cast in lead, in bed, in burning, immemorium, how they'd fled, with scalp aflame and flaking faces, the still, the sake toasted places ash on the cottage garden, lying in dust in ginkgo tree, clinker supply, surprising the last class to leave without dismissal, like when black slag crept heaping up the yard, rushed jet against the window, and all the little ones went free, went absent from their lessons, forgot to bring a note, went running in the meadows, cow-tongued, rough, rash, irregular, do you licked tag stung by flowers? Come in for tea. Do you not see cumulus cloaked molester? We told you not to go quick. No, no, no address is safer. Stabbed through by tiny strange complaints which irritate poor mummy. Drive daddy to his radio, contaminating data. Riding the cyclone, calm, serene. Crossing frontiers on clouds of snow, chuckling below cheek to dropping cadeau. What name this wry imposter? Asbestos gloved, poor hung, benefactor loved and widely trusted, west of the fertile black soil march. A deadly penetration within grain, kernel, spore, and cell, gland, 
quick assimilation, slow, slow mutating mitosis unto terminal overflow. You cannot see nor taste or smell this potent infiltrator, chased from vast, ruined, ruthene steppe, wheat gulfed, beet green, deserted, craft, swathed, spun frost in unwashed lace, black bread upon the cloth, hard by tureen of cold, scummed soup, seasoned too hot, too hot indeed, with condiment new and shameful. Festoons of faded peasant praise pinned high by quiet adherents who grime nailed raised spoons round as tears from cross stitched, crumbed, shrove tied table. Blonde, lustrous, only child lifts dimpled blood tomato, sees from Mamochka's devout knee, wayward, dark, daring auntie chuck up a ball of naught but air. Pretending like a juggler, remember, once at the fun fair, aloft, immaculate, scoop-lapped, scarfed, haloed, hung aslant, untroubled icon virgin, illumined side saddle, suckling surveys fields, scythed by fever, slow, discreet, bow-legged babushka, aproned, obstinate on her porch, too late to dust. Too late to walk, too late even to scold, married for good or evil to her starched course, doomed habitat, swept clean of all but treason, routine excuse, random attack, eerie broomstick apocalypse, cloned megaton, bold lesion. And the rest of the things I'm going to read come for it, well, from what I hope will be a second full collection um, around the theme of creativity and procreativity. Walking, walking the beaches in the dunes here um, on the Murray Firth is a daily privilege and pleasure. Um, and the mind wanders off in some strange byways with me sometimes. And that's what happened here. And the poem turned up immediately and um, oddly, almost, almost, almost in its final form. Anyway, it's a funny thing. You lose a glove. <clears throat> you lose a glove, you think, I truly lost it way back then. You say, something fell. You say, how your fingers lay, crouched against the crimson darkness, upside down, and knitted like fontanelle. You think, nobody said it would be like this, so excruciating, stitch upon stitch. You think, how a mitten pours the path and gasps and sucks at puddles, unsure, alone and indolent, ungrown, stillborn, no longer warm. You search the wheat in dunes for you, and all along the snow-dropped edge of spring, where soon the burrowed sandpiper will soothe to sleep her sky-shy fledgling and find beneath each folded wing the memory of suffering, the way you lost a sister on a walk, or while you sat to read a book, as though time took back what it most missed without good reason or regret, as though to show the ease of it, the nostrum for forgetfulness. This next fragment belongs to a long sequence called Genesis each section of which addresses another aspect of motherhood. And this also appeared in Molly Bloom. Names. From the beginning, we think of names for things. How, when, why. We weigh them down with weather. Her womb is freighted with will be her. She is ageless. Let her be nameless and alone in becoming. We make sure to take what is ours to make into tomorrow, we say. He is ours. She is ours. We may sacrifice him to our God. Pray, give us another one, a girl this time, to dress in spring. We shall call her April. We will call her what we will, if it is all the same to you. You are not family. You are not one of us. She shall die young, 
legs akimbo, a gushing where the crown should be. She shall not suffer much. It was normal back then. We gave them names, baptized them. Good sire, good wife, God speed. We wrote them down, and now we call her apoplexy of the flesh. Poor, unsexed, willing womb, we name her Theotokos. I did not love her half as much as the Mauve Scabius, for example, or Bee Orchid, or Tremulous Anemone. And later, I uprooted she who wavered rootlessly in her beauty like lotus, adrift upon the world, volitionless, as all places of pilgrimage and prayer. A pale altar, I put her away from me like sin, I would not succumb to flare into fruit, to stare into that flawed fate. You could call it catastrophe. That would not be too strong an image. Imma, Mutta, Mama, Mama, Muda, Mem, Memory. She stoops in the hall, speaking of dogs and something to eat. You are still inconsolable. Ravenous for a treat, neither hard nor soft, or warm, nor quite so cold. Let go. She holds me close, like unasked relinquishment, dire, patterned on the past. I call her sky-lynched apocalypse of the mind-lost couch. High dereliction. I always did my best for you, madman. He cries out, cloud-clad cataclysm. Mesmerized Madonna, arbored among monks, purged of impurity by some sin seared priest, sculptress of air, she reeks of frankincense and her toes are bare. They touch her everywhere. Sometimes she is sold. I knew her by her old name, untold, veiled in obsidian perda, hidden as her hair pinned up between dark galaxies. Here are entreaties. You can hardly reach us now, you see. We've roamed so far from home. To close them, this is a poem about an encounter <clears throat> I had at the May Festival, which is a small but perfect book festival, normally held at the old quad in the University of Aberdeen. There's always a concert in the 16th century King's College Chapel, whose choir smells of stone and waxed oak and is lit by rainbow rays dropped through the old stained glass of, of the ceiling of the chapel. It's absolutely exquisite. So this is for the boy who wept at Foray's Requiem. Borage blue sky, unclouded, as cobalt eye, old stone, fenestrate place, star, smitten, upturned face, glazed gold, azure, dazed, cherubim, swam, troubled jade of interned sea, caught piteously, pray for me, a little birth, a lamb, low-born, in blood and snow, opal, apostle, fist of flame, names, Jack, James, Stephen, Latin, carved in old black oak, a back white lace framed face, sinless as love's plain song, a prayer flown apse, altarless, bare as ages stripped of singing stone, echoing holy Mary muse, a requiem for them, amen, another Kyrie, a liaison, a son, a mother seated in the choir, calm beauty, Beneath reaching roof of upturned arc, steep, stern drop, dream deep, drown. The boy is lost at sea, head bowed. Suddenly, she sees he is weeping, averts her gaze, preserves his dignity. He rubs his eyes, ten years, eleven maybe. I see, he gives me glass, he gives me sliding river flow. Sepia light above shy upturned glaze of stone, and dispensation at last, he gives me grace to melt like glass eyed sky 
or sealed sepulchre of salt become rainbow sprung cell, sung open as the book of life itself. Oh, thank you. Wow. I, uh, I mentioned Kate's impassioned commitment before she started, and I think she just demonstrated that quality very clearly and movingly. Thank you so much, Kate. Oh, thank you very much. Um, the sort of reading I think that would be greeted with a thoughtful silence at the end, even if it wasn't physically present and un unmuted. So, yeah, well done, lovely. Thank um, you. We turn finally tonight to the man who has the task of following that, um, Ian Davidson, who I still think of as a Northeast poet, though I don't think he was actually there for very many years between his upbringing and early adulthood in North Wales, and now dividing his time between a small holding in southwest Mayo and Dublin's fair city, where he's Professor of English and Creative Writing at uh, UCD. Um, the Mayo small holding is not just his home, but also effectively the central character of his 2021 Oyster Catcher pamphlet from a council house in Connaught, which um, I warmly recommend. It's something between poetry and a collection of absorbing essays, um, something between a personal and a local history. Um, also new this year is By Tiny Twisting Ways, from Aquifer Press, um, which I'm afraid I can't recommend merely because I haven't yet read it. Sorry, Ian. Um, um, with a number of pamphlets and collections uh, behind him, uh, Ian's selected poems will be published by Shearsman next year, along with a new collection from Red Squirrel Press in 2022. Uh, he's also published monographs, articles, and essays on modern and contemporary poetry, including on the work of George and Mary Oppen, and most recently, an extended consideration of the work of Bill Griffiths, in the Blackwell Companion to British and Irish Contemporary Poetry and an essay on Deanda Prima's revolutionary letter. Um, I think that together gives you a kind of a sense of the, uh, the stature of, of, of the man and the sort of area of modern poetry interest that he moves in. Um, over to you, Ian. Okay, thanks, Ian. <clears throat> I'm gonna start uh, by reading uh, a poem that was that was in Molly Blue. So uh, thanks, Aidan, for the invitation to read here, and also congratulations on 25 issues, which is uh, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read as if again, uh, which is a poem about um, escaping your fate or trying to escape your fate. Sprinting to escape fate, and the biology that bugs. Maybe freedom is not as Blake may have said inside you, but a collect call, a distant disembodied voice you have to pay for and lets you off the hook. Or freedom is found in the sound of a hummingbird moving in and out of the hive of leaves we come to call book. Looking for other lives with the honey of the past dripping from fingers soiled on real parchment. This is not the knotted work of arms with rolled cuffs, sleeves to the elbows, digging a trench or cutting warm peat or fixing the raspberry cage with whatever comes to hand. But the double-sided fork-tongued work like words on a page, telling the story as if plain fact, as if anything can happen. Before I read the next poem from uh, Molly Bloom, I'm going to share the screen and you'll see text and images uh, on the screen. Um, And this next poem, which is called I Saw It All and It Was Moving, is around a, um, written, I suppose, from a, um, about a, a collection of rocks that are out in the bay near where I live. And um, they're rocks that have a religious significance and also have a causeway that goes up to them uh, like that. I saw it all and it was moving. One, many ways to come into land. 
land revealed as layers patiently brushed aside or scoured by a storm from far at sea. The friction from little divils riding the waves. Branches lift their toes and teeter. Otters follow, fo otters follow leaving scent on an underwater track to a rocky mouth of broken teeth that gapes open at all angles. Seawater washing, foaming down the gullet past rocky ribs. The fallen angels gather round. Broken rocks become teeth that become an impossible airway for an expanding globe where wings just begin to catch air, just begin to lift off the surface. The sea breathes as sand falls to the seabed as a curtain. Islands loom closer then disappear. Sand is covered then discovered, making land anywhere. I'm now going to read a couple of poems from uh, the pamphlet that Aidan referred to called From a Council House in Connacht. Uh, and the text will be uh, there in front of you. So I'm first of all going to read the foreword. In the wind funneled down the valley and the fast attacks of rain and desperation, I forged a pact between the still mountain rushing spirit of the river and white light stained by glass, I gave my heart to the ragged margins of a lake where rushes had still not turned their summer green. Particulars of the pact were between states of mind and unspecified. The mountain was steadfast. The river flushed out bad blood. Water is our friend. The light through the window shattered. It is now payback. I turn dark earth with aching arms, I plaster rough concrete walls of a shed, replace an iron roof, rotten timbers, dig out an oily floor and make it ready for the life to come, the long years turning. One, I sit in a council house in Connor, staring out at the meal re. The green of the Atlantic can just be glimpsed through the neighbor's sheds and a barn on a hill with a rounded iron roof. From the back of the land that surrounds a house, the sky opens out to include a broad expanse of sea between Inish Turk and Inish Clare. The light is astonishing. The light fills you up, eradicating dark corners. It illuminates and there is no answer to it the eye of the sun. When cloud found its way round a mountain or water thunders underfoot through tunnels of peat, or the eye of the sun is on you. A distant island is a volcano for the time the sun shuts its eye. Lids close slowly, lashes brush hillsides, feather weight, sun beams, accumulations of cloud. Thirteen. Land, water and the vertical and horizontal borders between them. Liminal shores that you can dip a toe into or go knee deep, breaking through a surface of turf. Deep black ditches where peat water flows. In May oh, the water might be under the land, a bog that ripples. All that walks a bog slide. Roads are slivers of tarmac on top of a wavy bog. The road must take its shape. When landlords walk the earth, improving the land was a mug's game. As the widow said to Asenath Nicholson in 1845, if I make my acre tidy, the agent puts a pound on the rent or turns me out. So the land lay unnurtured, fit only for potatoes, the landlord's friend that kept the earth turned and the peasant strong enough to work, but without the energy to bring revolution. 
the peasant sustained in the landlord's eyes as the lazy peasant, apparently too feckless to care for their land. Seventy. After the revolution, no free state for the pigs, who moved from the fireside to the sty, losing their place as payers of rent and providers of crackling to the pig lords. In the revolution, the land went to those who worked it. In the civil war, the big houses were razed to the ground and the English press and English history kept mum in case such practices might cross the Irish Sea. Unrest might spread like republicanism. I'm now gonna read a few poems from um, By Tiny Twisting Ways, which is just out from Aquifer. And my uh, thanks to Lyndon Davis. So I'll read the, uh, uh, Acknowledgement. This sequence is for Elizabeth, or the I'll read the dedication. This sequence is for Elizabeth, who survived the cancer this work finally describes, and for my neighbours in County Mayo who kept their candles lit. Many of the poems in the sequence are written in a seven syllable line, a quantity often used in early medieval Irish and Welsh poetry. And number one. At sea, all the broad beach, a variegated sky's final call to prayers, stretched as a whale's bones long in the sand and massive. Within encircling mountains, black-faced sheep keeping watch, collies chase the economy like car wheels or the red hair through the reed beds. Pasture covers field systems and crocks of gold at varying depths. Everything is up in the air and deep water as a wave curls and lands, wiping its face in a surface of sand, its expression fleeting as a child, ready to make an entrance. Wave upon wave gathering, then returning, altered every time. Five. At mass with seawater up to our necks, the tide neither in nor out, our underwater bodies the shape of fish. Wind whispers through the walls, rain falls and hits our eyelids. They close, cutting off the outside world. We live in the weather in a state of grace. God has come to Connacht and nothing stays the same except the steady state of change and the order of mass. The new water falls in the hills, rushing to the sea through rivers that rise and fall. The sea sends it back, cliffs crash to the ground, rivers back up until the usual light streams are torrents. Cars are tossed leaves in the gales. Driving back, people flowing like fingers along small roads and into gloved hills. Number 12. Things that never stop, roar of the wind, the shifting of sand, a tumour growing inside itself. Boulders squeak like marbles at the base of the cliff, turning against the tide for the erosion fields of boulders, radically altered under pressure from deep water, changing daily. Pathways blocked to the pure shining skin of sand, untouched by human hand or foot, the crash of their rearrangement, the boulders like fields of the dead, what dark power moves them. As if a cancer growing ragged round the edges could withstand the storm surge of a sea from immeasurable depths. Such force could pop a tumour like a zit, burst the bubble of sickness, invisible force field of an illness around the house like a bathysphere bolted down tight. 
against the shifty sea and its false faces, mountains move by tectonic time. Clouds cross their uplands deep inside. They laugh at the sea, its tidal urges tossing up kelp, a whale, unimaginable dead things. How can disease prevail as each wave heads to the shore, as each fresh fall of rain becomes a river of light, as mountains, when called upon, responded. People shifting sheep from field to field, down from the commonage to the nurtured lands around the house. The hands of shepherds dressed for mass. Peace be with you. In the slow turning of the year, cancer must wither and die. We stay in for the storm, for the wind and rain, still and waiting. And then finally, number 20, lumps and bumps. Names excavated from the landscape, names picked up by currents cross the Atlantic all at sea in a heavy swell. River banks keeping things safe, flowing in one direction like a bloodline. She has three drains like bullet wounds, a trinity arranged as the shamrock. She lifts her shirt, her body has valleys and hills in another's hands. Her names head back from the coast through townlands and bald hills after chemo radio. Mind stripped of rhyme or reason, nerves on edge. A name is like a cradle rocking her to sleep. Suffering is a centrifuge that spins out names for examination. Pressed against glass in alien rhythms, a healer discovering disease from syntax to sentence. Fathers align on their vowels, feet on ridge ground, hips swaying, landscape taking shape. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, extraordinary that I, I, I'm not used to seeing the words at the same time as hearing them. It's fascinating how differently you read um, those lines from the way you've, way you've written them uh, in, in terms of the line breaks. Uh, there's all sorts of things going on there that could um, merit some um, investigation, I think. Anyway, that's all, folks. Um, I hope you've enjoyed all three of these readings as much as I have. Um, three poets I'm very pleased and proud to have published in Molly Bloom and indeed to have brought to you now. Um, so in want of being able to repair to a good pub with you all, I wish you all good night, or in Ian Britton's case, good morning. Um, do check out Molly Bloom 25 if you haven't done so already, and let's all look forward to being able to attend readings in person again. Although when we do, we'll never be able to get the same geographical reach as we have on this occasion. Um, for now, however, uh, goodbye. Thank you, and till next time. Great, right, and thank you.